So here to speak today, we have Dr. Matthew Dentith, who's a philosopher and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bucharest um, Institute for Research in the Humanities. He completed his thesis on the epistemology of conspiracy theories in 2012. He also written the 20. He also has written the 2014 book called uh, "The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories," that, among other topics, explores whether the assumption that belief in conspiracy theories is typically irrational is well founded. It's also available for purchase and would make a great Christmas gift. Uh, he hosts a podcast called The Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, in which he and a colleague explore uh, various topics related to conspiracy theories. Um, so without further ado, I introduce Dr. Matthew Dentith for his talk titled, Investigating Conspiracy Theories, The Case for Treating Conspiracy Theories Seriously, Even the Apparently Ridiculous Ones. Thank you, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Now I'm going to give you one warning. I'm a New Zealander. New Zealanders are the fastest speakers of English in the world. And when I get excited, I tend to speak quickly. When I talk about conspiracy theories, I speak quickly. So if I end up becoming incomprehensible, please feel free to tell me to slow down. I will, I will not hold it against you. I'll probably write a paper about why you're a bad person, but I won't hold it against you in this actual talk. All right, so with that warning to one side, let me begin. Imagine, if you will, that at the root of all religions is a primal fear of the alien, that the religions of the past and the now are systems of control designed to both manufacture and sustain fear for the purposes of controlling humankind. Now, this thesis is not in itself extraordinary. Atheists and critics of organized religion have for a long time talked about the idea that religions are a controlling influence in our cultures. Indeed, for some parts of history, it's actually quite difficult to be able... Oh, the screen has gone completely white, and I have no idea why. Hmm? Hold on. Sorry. We've got a... There we go. Nope. Okay, we have a bit of an issue with the slide, so we'll just, we'll just move on from that. I had, a I had a lovely picture of an alien shape-shifting reptile I was going to show you, which kind of gives away the point here. There are some people who claim that organized religion is indeed a deep-seated conspiracy by an, a set of interdimensional shape-shifting alien reptiles, either from another planet or another dimension, who have been controlling us since time immemorial. Uh, this is the view which is basically propounded by a former soccer star in the UK, a former BBC journalist and now New Age guru, David Icke, who tours the world giving eight to ten hour long lectures, so you're getting off lightly with only 45 minutes today, talking about how the world is controlled by alien shape-shifting reptiles, and the evidence for this thesis is to be found in the fact that most world religions have serpentine imagery associated with them. And he takes it that this is evidence positive that the reptiles have been with us since time immemorial, creating our religions, our cultures, and now our financial institutions. And not just that, they are now interbreeding with us, placing their children in positions of power around the world. Your president is an alien shape-shifting reptile. My prime minister is an alien shape-shifting reptile. You probably live with an alien shape-shifting reptile. Now, this is the kind of weird and unusual conspiracy theory that many people point towards when saying, look, conspiracy theory is a bunk. Conspiracy theories are bogus. Conspiracy theories are the kind of things that only deeply weird or psychologically troubled people believe. And the David Ikes of this world are the kind of people who cause trouble for scholars like myself, because I have spent the last few years defending belief in conspiracy theories and also celebrating conspiracy theorizing as a phenomenon. I think we should treat conspiracy theories seriously and we should investigate them. But the David Ikes of this world are the kind of people who, when they engage in their activities, 
are the kind of people who go, well, you can't be serious. You're defending a David Icke. You're defending an Alex Jones. You're defending a Sebastian Gorka. And these are not the kind of people who deserve defense. We can't take conspiracy theories seriously. They have drastic consequences. And indeed, if alien shape-shifting reptiles are not your cup of tea, then you probably... Oh, this is really... Oh, I, I know what's happening. All right. Now it will make sense. You probably have an opinion on conspiracy theories that say things like vaccines cause autism. Anthropogenic climate change is a hoax. Or evolution by natural selection is an atheist lie. Because all of these claims have conspiracy theories associated with them. The conspiracy theory about vaccines is quite simple. Allegedly, the pharmaceutical industry and the medical fraternity are engaging in a long-term conspiracy to cover up the fact that the increase in the prevalence of autism here and now is linked to the MMR vaccine schedule and possibly the use of thimerosal or lead within vaccines. People who are concerned about anthropogenic climate change tend to be concerned that maybe climate change is a hoax foisted upon us either by climatologists who want that sweet, sweet federal funding or was created by the Soviets when they pretended to give up communism and went green rather than red. And some people are of the firm belief that evolution by natural selection is a liberal lie designed to turn us away from God. And belief in these theories has consequences. So because people, some people, believe that vaccines cause autism, they aren't vaccinating their children, leading to a higher prevalence of childhood diseases and increased morbidity, and also to a large extent, many people turning away from conventional medical practice, which has health outcomes. People who think that climate change is a hoax foisted upon us by scientists or the communists are likely to repeal laws designed to preserve the ecological prosperity of our planet, thus leading us into possibly a dystopic Mad Max-style future. And people who believe that evolution by natural selection is a politically motivated theory, as opposed to the result of good scientific practice, may well ask that we teach the debate in classrooms, or give equal weight to creationism and evolution in our biology classes, having an effect upon the educational outcomes of students. So there are social consequences to these beliefs. And indeed, if you read the academic literature on conspiracy theories, conspiracy theorists, the kind of people who believe in conspiracy theories, are said to suffer from a multitude of sins, whether they are the kind of people who would conspire themselves and thus assume other people could conspire too, to presenting a clear and present danger to the polis. And the literature really is actually quite expansive when it comes to the multitude of sins that conspiracy theorists are meant to suffer from. Uh, right down to claims such as that of Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule who advocated the best way to stop conspiracy theorizing in our polis would be to conspire against the conspiracy theorists. Something which, when you think about it, is not going to stop conspiracy theorizing in the polis whatsoever. And yet, at the heart of many of these criticisms is a kind of weird dichotomy, which I think is best expressed by this quote from Sander van der Linden, Clearly, people and government have conspired against each other throughout human history. Healthy skepticism lies at the very heart of the scientific endeavor. Yet there is something fundamentally dangerous and unscientific about the nature of conspiracy theorizing. So yes, conspiracies occur, but let's not theorize about conspiracies. That would be dangerous. Now, conspiracy theory skeptics are right. There are consequences to belief in conspiracy theories, and belief in conspiracy theories can be corrosive to the public trust. But you know what else is corrosive to the public trust? The existence of conspiracies. We all know conspiracies occur. Political conspiracies are attested to all the time. 
Criminal and corporate conspiracy theories are regularly prosecuted through the courts. And yet, for some reason, conspiracy theories, theories about these conspiracies, are the kind of thing that we're a little bit worried about. Now, admittedly, I think there is, there is a legitimate concern here. And that, I take it, is a kind of multiplicity problem. There are a lot of conspiracy theories. I study conspiracy theories for a living, and I can't keep up to date with all the theories that I already know about, and I want to find out what's happening with them, let alone keep up to date with the new theories being generated on a day-by-day -day basis. So two days ago, when having coffee with Brian, I discovered this wonderful little conspiracy theory relating to the Congo Archon invasion of 1996. Now, I don't know what the Congo Archon invasion of 1996 entails. I need to do some research to find out what was going on in the Congo in 1996 and exactly what an Archon is. But this is just yet another example of a conspiracy theory which I discovered through a basic trawl of the internet and had to add to my lexicon. And then yesterday, this is one of the great things about traveling and giving talks is getting new and exciting examples, we had the new and exciting update in the Roy Moore saga, where it turns out that James O'Keefe, who's part of Project Veritas, had put a suspect, well, someone who claimed to have been abused by Roy Moore in contact with the Washington Post in order to run a sting operation against them, uh, and yet that seems to have completely backfired and fits in with a whole series of backfired stings by James O'Keefe. So this is a case of someone conspiring against a news organization being outed and all the conspiracy theories that are now being generated as to whether the Roy Moore campaign knew about it, et cetera, et cetera. So keeping up to date with these things is really quite difficult. And so we might end up being slightly dismissive of conspiracy theories just because we don't have the time or the inclination, or indeed the ability to investigate even some of them, let alone engage in an investigation of all of them. Now, it's probably at this particular point in time that we should talk definitions, because one of the things that you find when you do academic work on conspiracy theories is there are a variety of different definitions of what counts as both a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory in the literature. And I wager if you have any issue with what I'm going to be saying in this talk, it's probably going to relate to the way I'm talking about conspiracy theories, which comes out of the way in which I talk about conspiracies. So I take it that the simplest definition of what counts as a conspiracy is two or more people working in secret towards some end. Now, the reason why it's two or more people is that you can't conspire on your own. To conspire means to breathe together, to work collectively. To conspire, you need an endpoint. You don't need to achieve it. You just need to be working towards it. So you have to have a goal you're trying to achieve, and you do it in secret. These are the classical three parts of the definition of what counts as a conspiracy. And I think most people agree that is the basic definition of what ends up being a conspiratorial activity. Now I take it, a conspiracy theory is simply a theory about a conspiracy. It's any explanation which cites a salient cause of, a, of, of an event. So a conspiracy theory basically is I'm trying to explain why some event occurred within the world with respect to a conspiracy. The conspiracy is the reason why this event occurred. Now, the reason why you might think this is problematic is because of this. By my definition, a surprise party is going to turn out to be conspiratorial. Surprise parties, or at least most surprise parties, some surprise parties won't be, most surprise parties are organized by a group of friends they have an intended end, a good time, and they are typically done in secret because the whole point of a surprise party is it is meant to be, after all, a surprise. So a surprise party ends up being conspiratorial. Now, if I were the target of a surprise party, 
I'd probably come up with a conspiracy theory about what my friends were doing. Uh, on a side note here, no one has ever organized a surprise party for me, and this is deeply disappointing to me. <laughs> I really wish someone would organise a surprise party, but maybe that's part of the surprise. I keep going on about it, no one organises it, it's going to be an even bigger surprise when I die and they hold my surprise funeral. <laughs> now, if someone were organising a surprise party, I might start to notice things. I might walk into a room, and when I walk into that room, my friends suddenly change the topic, or they go remarkably quiet. I discover my friends are doing things with each other and they're not inviting me. And there's a really big birthday coming up next week and none of them seem interested in going to the restaurant I've chosen. In fact, most of them seem to be out of town and only one of them is inviting me to their house for my birthday dinner. Now I might go, oh, they're good friends, they're probably organizing that surprise party I've always wanted, I've got my conspiracy theory there, or I could believe they are in fact the worst friends of all time and decide I don't want to do anything for my birthday. Uh, and I have an example of this. I organized the stag party for my friend Grisham many, many years ago. And I did such a good job with my friend Will of hiding the fact we were organizing the surprise party that Grisham started complaining to his fiance that no one was organizing a surprise party and he couldn't be bothered going out that night. And that night was the night the stag party had been planned for and Sarah had to break the news that actually it was a surprise stag. Please act surprised when you arrive at, at, at the function. Sometimes you can conspire just too well. So I take it that that would count as a conspiracy theory, but many people would say, no, this is not a comfortable definition to work with. Conspiracy theories are of a particular type, and surprise parties are not the kind of thing that we would typically, typically think of as conspiratorial, and surprise party theories definitely are not going to be conspiracy theories. Now, I would say the reason why we think that is because we think that political conspiracies are more important than surprise parties. And I think you'd be right to think that. I think it's right to think that we should be concerned about the existence of conspiracies in our polis. But that just tells us they're more salient to what we think is important in the world rather than that these activities don't count as conspiratorial. So we are rightly interested in political conspiracies but it doesn't rule out other types of conspiratorial activity also counting as being both conspiracies and the proper subject of a conspiracy theory. And indeed, if we think of conspiracy as a commonplace activity that people engage in, whether it is in politics, in family dynamics, or amongst friends, then that affects our ability to judge whether we think conspiracy theories are likely to be true or false, because they end up being part of the evidence we use when we're talking about judging the warrant, whether we should believe in or find rational, some conspiracy theory we've heard. If we think conspiracies are common, we're more likely to think that maybe a conspiracy theory might be part of the explanation for this particular kind of event. Well, so if we rule out a whole lot of conspiratorial activities as being the proper subject of a conspiracy theory, we are artificially restricting the pool of examples we can use to argue that sometimes our suspicion about a conspiracy should actually be followed up and investigated. And indeed, conspiracy theorists are very aware of this. Conspiracy theorists use past examples of conspiratorial activity to argue that we should at least be suspicious about the existence of conspiracies here and now, and that we should think that maybe a conspiracy theory is in the running at the very least. And indeed, for certain types of activities, conspiracies end up being the only kind of plausible explanation that we can think of when it comes to weird political decisions, regime changes, and leadership coups, conspiracies more likely than not are going to be at least part of the story for these particular types of events. And indeed, sometimes, the only options we have end up being conspiracy theories. So I'm really going to push the boat out here on the idea that 
a conspiracy theory is merely a theory about a conspiracy. If you believe that the Twin Towers were destroyed by the act of a controlled demolition, which was orchestrated by elements either within the US government or some foreign nation who wanted to place the blame on a group called Al-Qaeda, then obviously you're talking about a theory about a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy theory, i.e. the official theory has been put forward, but it's a cover-up for what really happened. And most people are comfortable calling the variety of inside job or controlled demolition theories to be conspiracy theories. Conversely, if you think that 9-11 was committed by a bunch of hijackers working for an organization known as Al-Qaeda, who planned to commit a secretive but terrorist act upon American soil, then that too is a theory about a conspiracy. The 9-11 attacks, the terrorist attacks on New York, Washington, D.C., are examples of a plot by two or more people acting in secret to achieve some end. It's a, this kind of terrorist activity is classically conspiratorial, and thus it would end up being a conspiracy theory. Now, many people will say, well, look, yes, it's a theory about a conspiracy, but it's the official theory. And we don't often talk about official theories as being conspiratorial. Official theories are different from conspiracy theories. But I don't think that's a workable conclusion to come to because of some historical examples. So in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin was quite convinced that his former friend and now enemy in exile, Leon Trotsky, was engaged in a conspiracy to return back to Soviet Russia and engage in a regime change where Trotsky would become chairman of the Communist Party. Stalin sent out the proto-KGB to find evidence of this plot by Trotsky. The proto-KGB came back and said, look, we've looked at it, and as far as we can tell, Trotsky's only plan at this particular point in time is to foment a communist revolution worldwide and force Russia to march in lockstep when the rest of the world turns communist. He has no intention of returning back to Russia. Stalin said, I told you to go find evidence that Leon Trotsky is conspiring to return to Russia to enact regime change. And you haven't found me that evidence. And you know what happens to people who don't please me. So the proto-KGB go off and for nine months they kidnap psychologically and physically torture a whole bunch of compatriots of Leon Trotsky and get them to testify in 1936 in the Moscow trials that Trotsky is engineering a plot to return to Russia to enact regime change. After the trial transcripts are released, and I should point out the people who testified that there was a conspiracy were executed and their families were either executed or sent to Siberia, this man, John Dewey, noted educationalist and philosopher, formed, and this is a lovely wordy title, the Commission of Inquiry into the charges made against Leon Trotsky in the Moscow trials. His commission, which operated for several years, investigated the trial transcripts, and they found some remarkable discrepancies. For example, Leon Trotsky was having meetings in two different cities at the same time in Europe, at a point in time where there was no rapid transfer system. That seemed a bit inconsistent. More alarmingly, Trotsky's son, who died, continued to have meetings with people post-death. There were some issues with the trial tra transcripts. The Dewey Commission then concluded these trials were a sham. They were mock trials. They were trials with pre-arranged verdicts. They delivered their report to the governments of the US and the UK to pressure them to get Russia to admit to this. And the UK and the US did their due diligence. They rang up Stalin and said, look, did you conspire? to arrange these trials, and now I'm saying this, I'm thinking this sounds like Trump talking to Putin about potential hacking situations. History does tend to repeat itself. And Stalin said, no, this is disinformatia, which is the invention of the term disinformation, a term used to tar the Dewey Commission's report as being a vapid conspiracy theory. And this was the official theory up until 1956, when, after Stalin died, Nikita Khrushchev 
on becoming chair of the Communist Party, decided to distance himself from Stalin's regime and admitted that the trials were a sham, the verdicts were prearranged, and that the Dewey Commission had been right in matters of fact the entire time. This means the official theory in the 1930s is now the conspiracy theory. And the conspiracy theory of the 1930s is now the official theory. I just don't think it's a particularly workable solution to say there's a distinction between things being official versus things being conspiracy theories. We should just embrace the term conspiracy theory and say that sometimes they're officially endorsed, but it doesn't stop them from being conspiracy theories. And if you want a more recent example, think of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Officially, the reason why Western powers invaded Iraq was to find those pesky weapons of mass destruction. That was the official theory coming out from Downing Street and the White House. Admittedly, this was not a widely believed hypothesis, either by the populations of the US or the UK, and actually wasn't a widely believed hypothesis worldwide. My government was of the firm belief that actually the official theory was some kind of smokescreen for America and the UK's want, as was the view of France and Germany and other nation states. So people just didn't take the official theory to be anything other than potentially a cover-up for what was really going on. So I would say it's easiest to work with this broad definition that rules in a lot of conspiratorial activity and thus allows us to look at a wide variety of different types of activities and how they relate to these things we call conspiracy theories. We use a broad definition of conspiracy to admit that there are lots of conspiracies out there. We use a broad definition of conspiracy theory to point out that you can theorize about all different types of conspiratorial activities. And you use a broad definition that doesn't place any artificial distinctions on what we rule in or rule out as being the proper topic of a conspiracy theory. Now, some of you will be realizing that there might be a bit of a contradiction in what I'm saying here. Because earlier, and maybe, maybe, maybe not contradiction, but something contrary, earlier I said there are too many conspiracy theories. There are too many that I know of, and there are too many being generated. And yet I've just asked us to admit in a whole lot more conspiracy theories. Now, admittedly, when you add too many to too many, what you get is still too many. Too many by definition is too many to cope with. You add even more to your burden, your burden is still, you're still overburdened by this particular point in time. But the benefit of adding too many to too many is that it makes us realize how ubiquitous conspiratorial activity is. And once we realize how ubiquitous conspiratorial activity is, then we can get round to the messy business of actually investigating conspiracy theories. Now, I've talked a lot about conspiracy theories, and I've kind of talked about how we need to investigate them. Let's actually look at some examples of investigated conspiracy theories. And I want to start with a delightful example which comes from Portland from the 1980s. Uh, this is the so-called Polybius conspiracy. Uh, some of you probably aren't old enough to know what an arcade complex is. Arcade complex was a place where people of my age, which is 40, in the old days when we were younger, would go and put coins into a machine to play very, very primitive computer games. It was a great way to use up all your pocket m money and the games we were playing were much less sophisticated than the games you're playing on your phone here and now. And arcade complexes in the 1980s were a weird place because games would come and go. Uh, it was one of those situations where if a game wasn't successful, the game would basically disappear from the complex, sometimes never to be literally seen again. Many games got test marketed in one particular location, turned out to be completely unsuccessful and were never heard of or just end up being a footnote in a history book. But in the early 80s in Portland, there was a particular computer game in the arcades which caught people's attention. And this was the game 
Polybius. Polybius was made by a company called Stenis Lotion in 1981, and it was meant to be a bit of a mind trip to play. People reported after gaming sessions on Polybius, nausea, memory loss, psychotic breaks. And people talked about how between sessions, mysterious workers in grey or black overalls would tinker with the machine. Now that in itself is not unusual. Uh, if you actually know anything about arcade games, they were notoriously fickle machines and needed constant tinkering in case they were going to break down. But the psychological and physiological effects are unusual for the time. And people have been quite curious to know what Polybius was about because there are no surviving machines and no surviving software or ROM dump has ever been located. And yet if you look up Polybius online now, you will find there are a legion of very unusual conspiracy theories about what the machine was meant to be doing. Some people are of the firm belief it was part of the MK Ultra experiments that were going on in the 80s, where the American government, because it was in a cold war with Russia, was investigating all sorts of strange and unusual mind control techniques. And, as we know with respect to certain medical conspiracies which have turned out to be true, certain organisations have not been against the idea of performing their experiments on the public if they think they can get away with it. And so people think the reason why we know so little about Polybius and why there's nothing left of the Polybius machines is entirely due to the fact that it was a CIA plot. And indeed there is now a bounty out to find examples of these machines to find out what was really going on. However, there's a bit of a problem. And I get most of this information from this great documentary available on YouTube uh, called The Polybius Conspiracy. The story doesn't really add up. So the Polybius machine was created in 1981 by Sinus Lotion. It appears for a few weeks in Portland and then it disappears. And there's a whole bunch of stories about people getting sick. Except, those stories don't appear until 1998, which is almost two decades after the events in question. And they first appear online in a Usenet post. Those of you who don't remember arcade machines may not even know what Usenet is. It was the internet before we had web browsers, uh, forums. Uh, you can go look up Usenet, it's, it was quite the experience back in the day. So it first appears as a mention on rick.video.games.arcade.collecting, where someone says, has anyone heard of this game called Polybius? It had all of these weird things, it was in Portland in the 1980s. And the response by the arcade collectors on this group is, doesn't exist. I mean, I'm an arcade game collector, if I knew about something called Polybius, I'd know about it. So the story kind of ends on Usenet at this point. But around about the same time, it appears as a page on a coin CoinOp coin Museum, which kind of lists it as a missing game that no one has any inf information about. But once again, no one pays it much attention until, in 2003, it gets mentioned in GamePro magazine as an urban legend deemed to be inconclusive. Where does GamePro magazine get the information from? The CoinOp Museum page. Where does the CoinOp, uh, where does the video game collecting posts seem to come from? Someone associated with the CoinOp Museum website. And yet from this, an entire series of conspiracy theories about the Plibius game have emerged online and taken on a life of their own. And I would say that the kind of investigation that the person behind the Plibius conspiracy documentary, Stuart Brown, aka Ahoy, did, is a great example of someone treating a conspiracy theory seriously and going through the archival information to find out whether there's any substance to this claim and pointing out that the biggest fault in the story is that the only mention of Polybius online or in print turned out to be two decades after the fact 
and appears to be an example of someone trying to drive traffic to their web page using a plausible cover story of a CIA MK Ultra style plot in the idea that once you go to the CoinUp Museum page, you might check out other similar pages. The conspiracy theory itself doesn't appear to have much legs, but investigating it still tells us a really interesting story. And we're going to find that stuff when we're investigating conspiracy theories, that some of them, possibly many of them, aren't going to hold much water. But then, of course, you get some investigations which end up being slightly more disturbing. Uh, so, actually, this is one, we have breaking news on this from yesterday. So you might remember a few years ago, and this is actually a, particular, a delightfully Cal Cal Californian example, uh, one of your regulators here in California worked out that the VW Golf, which is a diesel car that's meant to be a low emissions vehicle, was engaged in cheating practices. So each individual car was able to cheat in laboratory conditions because VW, rather than solving the emissions trap system that would make their cars do less pollution, instead invented a bit of software that was able to detect when a car is in a lab being tested for emissions and thus throttled down its emissions in lab conditions. And then when it left the lab, would pollute like nothing else on Earth. So VW solved one issue when really they should have put that engineering mouse to another entirely. And this turned out to be a 10-year conspiracy. VW had been doing this not just in America, but also in the EU. They'd had engineering teams working on this overtime. It turned out to be a massive conspiracy where VW were desperate to get funding for clean cars, but weren't able to solve the issue of making the cars clean, so decided to cheat instead. And the investigation into this was ongoing and uncovered a massive conspiracy by a multinational, where initially they just blamed a rogue engineer, then a rogue engineering department, and then it just kept going up and up the chain, leading to the resignation of their CEO, and now, as I say, engineer James Lang, who has been sentenced to 40 months imprisonment for his role, and he claims just to have been following orders. Once again... History repeats. And then, even more recently, and I could be talking about the Paradise Papers here, but I'm quite deliberately choosing uh, last year's massive leak, the Panama Papers, you have the situation where you have a large financial, or, or large financial discrepancy by billionaires engaging in either legal, but I would still say a moral tax avoidance, or money laundering through a Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca. Now, Mossack Fonseca's activities were quite deliberately conspiratorial, whether they were illegal. They were covering up where the money of their clients was going in order for a particular end, reducing their tax threshold, and doing it even once again if it were legal tax avoidance in the shadiest way possible. But what's fascinating about the Panama Papers was the conspiracy against Mossack Fonseca. Because the reason why we know about what Mossack Fonseca was doing was because the, in a set of journalists were sent a trove of documents about what Mossack Fonseca was doing, and then they formed a large-scale conspiracy to investigate Mossack Fonseca. So for one year, 80 journalists working for 107 media organisations in 80 countries interviewed former Mossack Fonseca employees, made official information requests, wiretapped, did the whole, the whole shebang, and were able to discover the extent of what that Panamanian law firm was doing without Mossack Fonseca ever being aware they were being investigated. The conspirators were conspired against by a community of investigative journalists engaging in a serious investigation of what appeared to be large-scale financial conspiracy. Which kind of brings me to what I want to focus on for the last part of the talk. Because investigating conspiracy theories is something that we should do. 
We should be concerned about the existence of conspiracies. Maybe we're not concerned about surprise parties, although I have certain friends who would find a surprise party to be psychologically jarring and would like to be on the, on the lookout for those as well. But when it comes to political conspiracies or corporate conspiracies, we ought to be concerned about their existence. And we want to know when it's rational to trust people in positions of power. We want to know what kind of society we would live in that would make us think they're free from conspiracy. We also want to know who's obliged to investigate these conspiracy theories, given that not all of us have the time, inclination, or the expertise. And we also want to know when it's rational to take a conspiracy theory seriously, even if it doesn't appear rational to believe it like your David Icke shape-shifting alien hypothesis. And the way we do this, I think, goes back to what John Dewey and the Commission of Inquiry were doing back in 1936. As I said, John Dewey was a noted educationalist, and one of the things which is interesting about John Dewey's work is his notion of the community of inquiry. So John Dewey had the notion that the best way for students to learn is for teachers to act as a guide. So the idea being that rather than simply lecturing to you, as I'm doing now, we should form a working group or a community, and we should be distributing the epistemic burden according to what people are good at or are interested in. So the community of inquiry model is a way of distributing labor amongst a group of people thus allowing that group of people to engage in an investigation which is not necessarily time costly for themselves because you're able to farm off particular duties or obligations to others when necessary. And these kind of communities are going to be comprised of experts. I'm a conspiracy theory theorist. My expertise is judging what counts as a conspiracy theory and what doesn't, and I've, I've fulfilled my burden with that today, as long as you agree with the definition that I worked with. And some of you are going to be historians, some of you will be sociologists, some of you will be investigative journalists, some of you will just be interested members of the public. And this well-constituted community is then going to distribute the labor of investigating claims of conspiracy amongst members of that wider community. Now, I would say this solves the multiplicity problem. There are too many conspiracy theories with respect to how many there are, let alone keeping up with them. If we investigate conspiracy theories as a community, then we are able to have a kind of multi-prong approach. I can focus on this particular one here. You can go out looking for another one. You can find a similarity between this one and the other one. And as a community, we start building up our corpus of data, our corpus of evidence, and our corpus of responses to be able to deal with the wide variety of conspiracies we encounter in the world. Now, nothing about this tells us that we're going to be endorsing any particular conspiracy theories. But all this tells us is that we're going to spend time thinking about them, investigating them, and coming up with reasons for saying we're treating this one seriously, and no, this one here, we don't think there's much to it. But it's the result of an investigation rather than the result of a dismissive approach towards conspiracy theorizing. Now, admittedly, you might respond by saying, but this is what we already do. I mean, after all, there are communities of inquiry which have investigated whether vaccines cause autism, whether anthropogenic climate change is a hoax, and whether evolution by natural selection is an atheist lie. But part of the problem is that I think we end up being in opposition. The communities we form either are to prove a particular conspiracy theory or to disprove a conspiracy theory. They're not starting out from a proactive position of going, we're going to treat this seriously and investigate it. They start out from a position of saying, either it is true and I'm going to show you why, or it's false and you're an idiot for believing it, here's why you're an idiot. So most investigations start with the conclusion and thus work backwards. 
which is why any kind of approach towards investigating conspiracy theories needs to accommodate the fact that you're going to have true believers and skeptics working in tandem for these kind of investigations. We don't want to have communities of like-minded individuals. We want a certain amount of opposition within our groups so that we are actually treating them seriously and not simply paying lip service to the notion of investigation. And the benefit of making sure that we have people from all sides of the spectrum involved is it makes it harder for people outside the group to deny the results of such a community of inquiry. Because if you have some kind of consensus within a diverse group engaging in this kind of investigation, then it's going to be much harder for people to say, oh, but that's what they want you to believe, when the they want you to believe includes members of your own organisation or your own views. But in closing, this still doesn't get us around the social costs. Because, as said before, there are social costs to talking about conspiracy theories. There is a loss of trust that some people suffer when they find out about a conspiracy theory. There's a kind of veneer of respectability that goes on in these situations, where just by talking about a conspiracy theory openly makes people think there must be something to it. It's one of the reasons why NASA doesn't really like to talk about moon landing hoaxes, because if they do talk about them openly, some people will say, well, they're expending a lot of effort to deny the claim, uh, sorry, to prove the claim we got to their moon. There must be something to the claim that we didn't get there. But the thing about investigations is they don't necessarily have to be public, or at least not initially. Think about what happened with Mossack Fonseca's investigation by the Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They operated in secret for a year, but then they published their result in a publicly accessible, searchable, and transparent manner, which allowed people to replicate their findings. And that means that you are able to produce the material after the fact in such a way which allows people to then verify or replicate your investigation. And after all, the costs are huge if we don't investigate conspiracy theories. Whilst not every investigated conspiracy theory is going to be true, if we don't investigate conspiracy theories, chances are people are going to conspire against us. And just as a, a final point, you might go, well, I started off with lizards. Probably should end with them as well. So do I think that we should treat the conspiracy theories of David Icke seriously? That alien shape-shifting reptiles from another planet or multiple dimensions have in fact been control of human civilization for five to 6,000 years. Surely this claim is so ridiculous that we shouldn't treat it seriously, let alone investigate it. What, though, if it turned out to be true? What if our entire system of governance, our entire system of control, was in fact the result of alien overlords who have been forcing us to live in a prison planet since time immemorial? It sounds ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. But if there's even the vaguest possibility of it being true, somebody should be investigating it so that we're sure that we don't live with alien shape-shifting reptiles controlling our every move and our every breath we take. That is why we have to investigate conspiracy theories. It sounds ridiculous, but what if it's actually true. Imagine how that would change the world. And imagine what people would do to make sure you never found out.